In part 3 of the series we discuss the most important key to receiving redemption blessings and how to put that key to work. All right, let's rise up to our feet please and we will make our declaration this morning and then we will get into God's word. So if you brought your Bible with you, you can hold your Bible high up in the air. Let's say this out loud, bold and strong. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of his blessing. To many people, I receive his word. I believe his word, and I live by his word. Christ is my master, and to him I am in absolute surrender in Jesus name. Amen. Please turn around to people next to you. Shake hands, give them a smile, say hello, and uh, you may be seated please. Thank you. The last couple of Sundays, we've been talking about receiving redemption blessings. And I just want to quickly review and zero in on uh, one very important key to receiving God's redemptive or redemption blessings for our lives uh, in the sermon this morning. When we began the series two Sundays ago, we talked about our predicament that all of us, because of Adam's sin, are under death. For one, by one man, sin came into this world, death through sin, death passed on all, for all have sins. So by one man, this happens. And we all are in that predicament, we are under death. But then Jesus Christ came to redeem us, to bring us out of that. And that's what we call as redemption. Right? He brought us out and he brought us into his kingdom. Colossians 1, 12, 13, 14. Uh, we talked about that. And uh, we said that in redemption, he has brought us into his kingdom and he has given us the right to partake of the inheritance of the saints. He's qualified us to partake of these things. But the question is, how do we receive our redemption blessings? How do we walk in? How do we receive it? How do we walk in it? So that's a question we're trying to answer. We're just building on towards that. And what we also said in the first part of the message is some of the blessings that are ours. We talked about from Deuteronomy 28, the blessings that they had in, under the old covenant. How God said, you're blessed coming in. You'll be blessed going out. You'll be blessed in all the work of your hands. Uh, you'll be blessed in your basket, your store, every area. Look, all these blessings are on you. They're part of my covenant blessings for you. So that's what we have. We have blessings in the natural realm, blessings in the spiritual realm. All of these things God wants over our lives is part of his redemptive blessings for us. So how do we receive those blessings? Last Sunday, we looked at a type. We looked at an example from the Old Testament of how God redeemed his people out of Egypt. And he took them into their land of promise. And we traced that journey and saw uh, that that was a representation, a type of our own spiritual journey. How God works in our lives in bringing us out of darkness and bringing us out of the bondage we were in. And taking us into the glorious liberty that he has for us as his sons and daughters. We looked at that. We said that there were two things that really kept the people out of the land of promise. Two things that can keep us out of our land of promise, our inheritance. And what were those two things? Unbelief and disobedience. Very good. <laughs> so two things that kept them out. Unbelief and disobedience. And those are the same two things that would keep us out from our land of inheritance. Our land of, uh, that God wants for us. Uh, the, the, from walking in the redemptive blessings. 
disobedience. God was saying, enter the land of promise. And they said, Lord, we want to go back there. We want to go to the other, back to the same place where we could, you know, eat those onions and garlics and, but still be in bondage. They wanted that. Whereas God was saying, I have a land for you flowing with milk and honey. Secondly, unbelief. They couldn't believe that God would give that to them. God said, that's land for this. There, yes, you have some battles to fight. There are some cities to take, some giants that you have to contend with. But that's for you. And they couldn't believe that God was with them to enable them to do that. Unbelief kept them out of the land of promise. And so we traced that whole journey. The land of promise also represents one very important thing. It represents a place of rest, we said. And so the message that we took away last Sunday, one of the keys was you have to fight from a place of rest. And I'm just reviewing what we did last Sunday. You have to fight from a place of rest if you want to possess the land. So this morning, we want to build, take this forward and uh, focus in on one very important thing that you and I need to do in order to receive redemption blessings. Let's begin with Psalm 103. It's a very familiar psalm for most of us. For many of us, we've read, probably read this psalm and we probably go back to it often. Psalm 103, we'll read just verses 1 through 6. This is a psalm of David, a man who knew his covenant with God. You know, when David went to face Goliath, he went out based on his covenant. You know, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who's challenging the armies of God? So he said, look, I'm a man who has a covenant with God. Here's a Philistine who has no covenant with God. How dare he challenge us? So David knew his covenant with God. And here's a man under the old covenant. And this is what he says. So Psalm 103, we'll read verses 1 through 6. Verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So David is saying, bless God. Bless him, worship him, love him, honor him, adore him, extol him. Bless the Lord, O my soul. All that's within you, bless him. And don't forget all his benefits. Don't forget all that he pours out on your life. He is the source of all of these benefits. So bless him because he's the one who's pouring out all these things on you and me. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits. Okay, so what are those benefits? Next verse. He for, who, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. Says, remember these are God's benefits. These are blessings that he puts upon his people. He forgives our sins. He heals all our Diseases. How did David understand this? Because he, through all that they had in the old covenant, was you know he, he understood this through what God had given to Moses and to his people through Moses. They would make these sacrifices. Why were they doing that? Because every time they made a sacrifice, they were believing our God forgives all our sins. It's very clear. And they knew the covenant names of God. And one of his covenant names was he is Jehovah Rapha. The Lord our healer. So David knew this is my God. These are the benefits he puts upon my life. He forgives my sins. He heals all my So under the old covenant, they knew this. God is a God who forgives. Is a God who heals. But what else were his benefits? Are these the only two? Two benefits? No, there's more. Next verse, he says, Who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. 
He redeems. That means he rescues, he delivers, he brings you out of everything that destroys your life. He redeems your life from... So what is destroying your life? What is destroying our lives? Sometimes it's financial problems. Sometimes it's, you know, loss of a job or different kinds of things that tend to destroy our lives. And God redeems our life from... He redeems you. He brings you out of what attempts to destroy you. Whatever it might be. That's his benefit. That's his blessing for his people. And he crowns you. To crown means to put upon you. He puts upon you his loving kindness and tender. So it's like a double word. He puts upon you his Kindness, kindness. And his mercies, mercies. He puts upon you his loving kindness and his tender. Now, remember, God is not somebody who has a good day and a bad day. <laughs> that he wakes up on Monday and says, oh no man, church was boring yesterday. <laughs> These guys didn't worship me enough. So today, no tender mercies, <laughs> no loving kindness. Right. That's, that's not God. Every day, he crowns your life with his loving kindness and his tender mercies. On good days and bad days. Good days and bad days are only from our side, not from his side. So on days that things are going really good, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. He crowns me with his loving kindness and tender. Think on days things may that, that things may not be going so well. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. He still crowns me with his loving kindness and tender. He has not changed. Things on our ends. You know, they're a little different yesterday and today, and so on. But who God is has not changed. So you can still bless the Lord. You can still bless him. He hasn't changed. He's still that same benevolent, good, loving, tender, gracious God. He still has his loving kindness and tender mercies for you and me. Right? He still redeems our life from destruction. And no matter what it might be that is trying to destroy you, he is the one who redeems us, pulls us out. So I don't know how I came out, but I came out, thank God, it's still here. He redeems our life from destruction. He crowns us with his loving kindness. And, ten and, and David says, these are the benefits. These are the blessings. These are the things that God bestows on his people. And then verse 5. This is something we all like. Who satisfies your mouth with good things. So that your youth is renewed like the eagle. So yes, you know, he brings provision. Basically, he brings provision into our lives. He satisfies our mouth with good things, meaning he brings his good provision into our lives. And he also blesses our health so that our strength, our energy, our vitality is renewed. He renews our youth like the kids. That's his benefit for you and me. Amen? And then, last verse we'll read, verse 6. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. So if you're being unfairly treated, oppressed, injustice, whatever, he says God will execute righteousness and justice on your behalf. He's going to intervene in your circumstance, your situation, where you may be unfairly treated, where people may be uh, dishonoring you in some way or another. God will vindicate you. He will come through. These are his benefits. Amen? Now, if a man under the old covenant could have this kind of a confidence in God, how much more should you and I, as people under the new covenant, which the Bible says is a better covenant and based on better promises, how much more should you and I say that these are the benefits and more that God has for his people? Amen? 
Now, you know, one thing I want to encourage us to do is speak psalms to yourself. It's a legal thing to do. It's a valid thing. In fact, the Bible encourages us speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Ephesians 5, 18, 19, 20. So, you're lying down in your bed. You're feeling depressed. What do you do? Say, say a psalm. I mean, I was going to say sing a psalm, but that might be a little risky. But, so just say a psalm. <laughs> you know, just say a psalm. You know, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. So I don't feel like it. It's okay. It has nothing to do with your feelings. It is the truth. Say it anyway. He forgives all my sins. He heals all my disease. I don't feel like it. It's okay. It's still the truth. Say it. Because the Bible says, speak to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Speak to yourself. I mean, when you speak, you encourage yourself. It's like, the, like David saying, why are you so sad? Why are you? King James Version says, why art thou disquieted, O my soul? You know, just make it modern. Why are you feeling so depressed? <laughs> why are you feeling so down, O my soul? Hope thou in God. So he's speaking to himself. Hope, come on. Hope. You know, why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. I shall yet praise him. He is the help of my countenance and my God. He's the one who lifts my face up. The help of my countenance. So God gives you a facelift. <laughs> he is the help of my countenance. That's what it means, right? He helps your countenance. And my God. So talk to yourself. Speak psalms to yourself. Encourage yourself. Because that word is good. Whether you feel like it or not, it's still valid. It's truth. So that is the Old Testament. Now when you come into the New Testament, it still reads the same. For instance, if you go to Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Uh, Ephesians 1 and verse 3. In the New Testament, the Bible says something very similar. It says this. Blessed be the God. David said, bless the Lord. Paul is writing, blessed be the Lord, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So God has blessed you. So say, I am blessed. You see, you and I are not trying to twist God's arm and convince him to give us a blessing. We're not trying to do that. He has already blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He says, look, I love you so much. You are my chosen. You are my people. I'm giving that to you. I'm blessing it. Your name's already on it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. That means every blessing he has. So I'm making it available. It's yours. In the heavenly realms, in the spiritual realm. In Christ. Jesus. So not, as he, not only has he blessed you, like we said in Colossians 1 verse 12. Giving thanks always to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has qualified us to partake of the inheritance of the saints in so he's qualified you. He's made you fit, worthy to participate, to partake, to enjoy your share of the inheritance of blessings that he has made available to his people. Amen? So you're worthy to partake of this. You see, the problem many of us have is, okay, you, you, know, you look at a pastor, wow, he's so spiritual. He's, so he's worthy to partake. Me, I'm not so spiritual, so I'm not worthy. That's wrong thinking. What does the Bible say? The Bible says it is God who has qualified each one of us to partake of his inheritance. None of us earn that. It's something God endows us with. He gives to us. He says, I make you worthy of partaking of this inheritance. It's yours. You, you're fit to partake of it. The point is you and I don't need to do anything more to make ourselves worthy. He's, he's made you worthy. It has nothing to do 
with our efforts. Amen? So that means you and I are already in position, ready to receive every blessing, all his benefits that he has for his people. There's only one thing, just one thing that God wants you and me to do. And we want to talk about that. Just one thing. What is it? What I want to do is very simple now. I want us to just read three incidents in the ministry of Jesus uh, from the Gospel of Matthew. So we'll go to Matthew chapter 8. And we will read from Matthew 8, Matthew 9, and Matthew 15. I just purposely picked these incidents, although uh, many of us are familiar with these. We've probably read them many times before. Uh, we will read them again. In these three records or incidents, we have two people who are not under covenant. We have a Roman centurion in Matthew 8. And in Matthew 15, we have a woman of Canaan. They were both non-Jewish people. In Matthew 9, we have a person who was under covenant. That means she knew what David knew. She knew what David knew. That God is healer. God is the one who forgives. God is the one who redeems. She knew that. Because she was a woman under covenant. She must have heard it taught to her. As part of the covenant. But in Matthew 8, you have a Roman centurion who probably was not even aware. But he just saw something happening. Two people under the covenant. And he said, I want to come and get some. In Matthew 15, you have a woman who again was probably not taught these things, but she saw the benefits that were being given to people under the covenant and she said, I want to come and get some. What, is the, what was the common denominator in all of these three cases that enabled them to receive? Very simple question, very simple answer. But let's just read this. Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 to 13. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to this one, go, and he goes, to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west, will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom, referring to the people of Israel, will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, let it be done for you. And this servant was healed that same hour. So this man came. He wanted to get one of those benefits. In this case, it was healing for his servant. So I want to get that benefit. I want to pass it on to my servant. Because I see all these other people getting it. But what was that one thing he came with? He came with faith in his heart. And Jesus marveled. I said, I, this man has such great faith. And he says, as you have believed, let it be done for you. As you have believed, let it be done for you. Matthew chapter 9, verses 20 to 22. This was a woman under covenant. She knew what was happening. She knew the God that David knew. She knew the benefits God had for his people. So here she comes, verse 20. And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. What was it that 
caused this woman to receive? Your faith. What caused the Roman centurion to receive? Your faith. And now Matthew 15. Here is a woman who's not under covenant. She also wants to receive one of these benefits. She wants to receive it for her daughter. And here's what happens. Verse 21 of Matthew 15. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon possessed. What did we read in Psalm? He will crown you with loving kindness and tender mercy. Have mercy. Just a little bit of mercy. My daughter is being troubled by demons. I need mercy. I need your mercy to get her free. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him saying, send her away for she cries after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus is saying, look, at this time, I am ministering to people who are under covenant. I am ministering to the people who are part of the nation of Israel. I have not yet extended it out beyond them. So how does this woman take that? Then she came and worshipped him saying, Lord, help me. She understood the covenant. I mean, the fact that, uh, fact of what Jesus said. But she still came to get a benefit that belonged to people under covenant. But he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. So Jesus is saying, look, I can't take what is, belongs to the children. Healing is the children's bread. This is what God has kept for his children. This is his benefits for them. This is their bread, something they have access to. This is their right. They can eat of it. But I can't take that and give it to those outside of the covenant. But she doesn't, does not let that deter her. She says, all I want is a crumb. Just a little bit. Things that you just discard. Just give me that. It's enough. So, said, woman, you've got great faith. You've got great faith. Be to you as you were. So yes, though. Common thread we see through all of these. It was their faith that enabled them to receive. Amen? And it is no different for you and me today. You see, you and I cannot believe beyond actual knowledge. You and I cannot believe if we don't know. But the problem we have is not lack of knowledge. Because we've been hearing, hearing, and hearing. We do not have a lack of knowledge. That cannot be our excuse. I don't know. No. But... Probably what we lack is mixing faith with what we're hearing. We hear, but you don't believe. And if you don't believe, you can't enter the land of promise. Are you with me? The one thing that we need is to have faith. Have faith. Believe that word that you hear. So we don't have a lack of hearing the words. You hear it in church, you hear it on TV, you hear it on the internet, you have books. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. The word of God's available. The truth of the word is being expounded, is being preached to so many different channels available for us. But are we mixing faith with what we hear? I'm not asking you whether you can quote chapter and verse. Because quoting chapter and verse is not the same as believing what the verse says. These two are different things. 
Knowing what the Bible says is not the same as believing what the Bible says. But this is where I think we miss it. Faith. Believing that our God. Amen. So, three simple, I don't want to call it steps, but three simple ways on how you and I exercise this faith in order to receive our redemption blessings. Three simple things. Number one, and this is very important and yet very simple. We talked about it last Sunday. I'll repeat it. Number one, it is enter in to your place of rest. So if you and I want to exercise faith in God, we must first enter into a place of now, that does not mean literally. <laughs> Please be awake. <laughs> so, okay, pastor said rest. <laughs> no. no. What does it mean to enter into a place of rest? It means that you come into a place where you settle the matter in your heart with the word of God. God has spoken. I'm settling it with his word. I'm settling into that word he has spoken. When you settle down in that promise, you have entered your place of rest. Example. If it has to do with a financial need. You know, and I'm just using this as an example. We could be faced with all kinds of things in life. And over our journey in life, all kinds of things come our way. I'm just using this as an example. If, suppose I'm faced with a financial need. Now I can sit up worrying about it. I may be able to quote Psalm 23.1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not. I may be able to quote it backwards. I'm not going to try. but <laughs> In other words, I may know the words. But when a financial need is staring me in the face, if I am being disturbed by it, I'm being troubled by it, I am worried, I'm anxious, I'm disturbed, I am not in a place of rest. I may know the word. My God shall supply all your needs. I know the word. I know what he has spoken. But I am still troubled, worried, Disturb. Some of us get, I don't know, nervous breakdown, this, that, whatever, all those things. Then I'm not in a place of rest. I'm nowhere ready to exercise faith. So the problem is not a lack of knowledge. We know the word. The problem is, are you exercising faith? In order to exercise faith, you and I need to first settle down in the word of God. That means God and his word has to become more bigger than the problem you're facing. God and his word should become so dominant in your heart, in your mind, that you say nothing is going to disturb me. I'm not denying the existence of the problem. I'm refusing the, pro the, I'm refusing the right let me put it this way. I'm refusing to give the problem a right to trouble me. Yes, the problem is there. But I'm choosing to be in a place of rest because of God and his words. That's being in a place of rest. If you want to exercise faith, first come into a place of rest. By, because of the words. God, you said. Now, I don't know. I know it's not always easy, but we have to do it. It's not always easy when you're facing something, a difficulty, crisis. This thing happens. Something happens to disturb your peace and your quietness. Obviously, you and I would get agitated. We will be disturbed. You might have worry, concern, anxiety. But that's when you and I have to choose to believe. The word. What did God say about that situation? What did he say? His word. 
the Roman centurion is an example of this. I mean, imagine the amount or the degree of confidence he had in the words of Jesus. So he comes to Jesus and Jesus says, you know, he says, Lord, my servant is at home. He's really troubled. He's sick. And Jesus says, I will come and heal him. Now, if it was you and me, that statement of Jesus may have got us so upset. Oh, no, Jesus is coming home. And I need to get the home ready. Call home. Wife, cook the best meal. Jesus is coming. Go quick. Order, you know, get on a big basket. Tell them to deliver immediately. <laughs> Whatever. It's, uh, it could have been a cause of concern. But you know this Roman saying, sure? He says, Jesus, don't even bother. Don't even trouble yourself. Just speak the. It's enough. Jesus says, That's great faith. All this man wants is my word. That's all he wants. And he says, Because I understand how authority works. When a person in authority speaks, his word has to get done. And when God speaks, his word has to get, it will get done. If you and I have that, that kind of confidence in God, the way the Roman soldier expressed that confidence in God, in, in Jesus Christ, we step into our place of rest. God has spoken. This is what he has said about my situation. Whatever that situation might be, God has spoken. I believe that word. So now I'm in a place of rest. I'm not denying the problem. I recognize the problem, but I recognize something greater. I recognize God has spoken. His word is greater. He is greater. So I'm going to be restful. And in that place of rest, you, are now, you and I are now ready to exercise faith in God. We then do what Jesus taught us in Mark 11, 22 to 24. We receive by faith. It is received by faith. That means you transact with God by faith. I know it, that word transact may seem a very business-like word, but I'm just using that as an example. You know, think about a lot of us do electronic transactions these days. You send an email are you going to be worried whether the email has reached the inbox of the other person? No. You just know when you click the send button, you go to sleep after that. You're confident that that whatever, that email, whatever you sent, reaches the other side. Or when you send money. So why a transaction, electronic transaction? It's gone to the... That account, you don't go searching that account, has the money come in? You don't have, you can't do it. You don't have access to it. You only send or receive, whatever. So think in, think in those kind of terms. That by faith, you receive from God. And in the realm of the spirit, you are getting the job done in the spirit. And you have the capacity to do that. Jesus taught us in Mark 11, 22 to 24, how to do that in the spirit. He said, have faith in God, verse 22. And then with that faith in God, you can do two things. In verse 23, you can speak. In verse 24, you can pray. In verse 23, he said, whoever therefore will say and will not doubt in his heart, but will believe that what he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. So back to this financial need scenario. First, come into a place of rest. Yes, there's a mountain of need facing you, but God's word says, my God will supply all your needs. So I've come into a place, of, I'm trusting God and his word. Second, release your, exercise your faith. You can speak. Speak to the mountain. Speak to that financial need. So you speak. And say in Jesus name. I speak to this financial situation in my life. And whatever that amount was. 
call it by its name. And say, I declare that need met. I release God's provision for that. Because God's word says that God will supply all my needs. So you declare that. Speak like that. You say, who's listening to me? God. God is listening. His angels are listening. The devil too is listening. So you speak to the mountain. Speak to that financial situation. I declare that need met. Jesus said if you have faith, you speak to your mountain. And you don't doubt in your heart that that mountain will move. You believe that what you say will come to pass. You will have what you say. So do it. Speak to the situation. Speak to that. And then verse 24. He said, when you pray, believe that you receive and you will have. So this is where the transaction completes. You believe that you have received. So Father, I pray for this financial need. I, I pray according to your word. I thank you that my God that supplies all my need. So I believe that I receive. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Case closed. Finished. Send button pressed. It's done. Believe that you have received. It's done. So you receive by faith. Based on Mark 11, 20, 22 to 24. So that redemption blessing, that redemption benefit, whether it's forgiveness, healing, redemption from something that's destroying your life, whatever it is, this is what you do. You speak to a situation by faith, you receive. The transaction completes. And he said, and you will have. It will come to pass in the natural. Now, Jesus illustrated that for us when he cursed the fig tree. So he gave a live demo and then he gave these verses. Did you notice when Jesus spoke to the fig tree, nothing happened to the fig tree right then? It's not like when Jesus said, no fruit grow on you hereafter, immediately the fig tree, the leaves, and that did not happen. The tree was still standing. But Jesus turned around and walked away. He didn't check. The Bible doesn't say, after Jesus went a furlong, he turned behind to see what happened. He, the Bible doesn't say that. He just went on. Why? Because he knew what he spoke. Believe in your heart. It will be. You will have whatever you. It's done. So immediately there may not be any change. But you are acting on what the Lord taught us to do. So the fig tree is still standing. The green leaves are still there. Nothing seems to be happening. Hey, but you're doing what the Lord said. You will have what he said. So the next day they pass by. They notice the fig tree with there. There may be a time delay, a time gap. By the time you start speaking to actually you start seeing. But you keep speaking until you see. Amen? So you do it. And then, the last one. When you and I exercise faith to receive redemption blessings, is we have to contend for it if the enemy attempts to rob you of it. Here's another area where many of us fail to receive our redemption blessings. Because there is an enemy, Jesus said, who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's not going to sit there and watch you enjoy your benefits. He wants to steal it, kill it, or destroy it. So he comes. But what does the Bible say? It's like one preacher said, you know, I have the devil on the run. It's not my original joke, okay? <laughs> so I may not be good in saying it. <laughs> 
But he said, the only problem is he's chasing and I'm running. <laughs> Guys got to laugh. And, you know, <laughs> try it again some other time. Okay. So, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Well, what do you do? Do you just say, okay, the devil's come to steal it? No, the Bible says, what must we do? We must resist him. Being firm in the faith. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary is the devil. As a roaring lion, he walks about seeking whom he may devour. But verse 9, whom resist steadfast in the faith. So he's seeking to devour. He's seeking to steal, kill, and destroy. But what must you and I do? We resist. We say no, devil. Standing firm in our faith. That means when the enemy comes, what you've done in step one, step two does not change. If the enemy, when the enemy comes, don't get out of your place of Stay there. When you're in your place of rest in God, you are invincible. Nothing can sink your ship. Amen? You're resting in God. So he may come to attack, steal, kill, destroy. Don't get agitated. Oh, devil's coming. 100 phone calls. <laughs> Broadcast message, WhatsApp. Everybody, please pray for me. Devil is after me. You know. Please, stay in your place of rest. Stay there. I'm not saying it's wrong to get prayer support, but don't get anxious. Don't get worried. Peter said, the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren in the world. I mean, all the other people of God are also facing these things. So it's not uncommon. Stay in your place of rest. And don't alter the fact that you've prayed and asked God and received from God. That will not change. You've prayed. You've believed. Don't alter what you're speaking. Keep speaking what God's word says. You continue believing that what he has spoken, what he has prayed and asked, is you've received. And now you resist the devil. You say, no devil. These are my benefits. My heavenly father has made these available for me. He forgives my sin. He heals my disease. He redeems my life from destruction. He crowns me with loving kindness and tender mercies. And all the other promises in the word of God that you would want to, uh, you stand for and believe God for, for your life, for your family, your home, your children, your finances, your present, your future. Every word of God, every promise of God is yours. Every redemption blessing is yours. You stand your ground. Amen? So I want to encourage each of us this morning. You know, faith. There's one thing called faith. It's so important. So important. We have knowledge, but if we don't have faith, we will not receive what we know. Faith receives. Faith enables you to walk in your Redemption, blessings. So stand strong in your faith. Rest in your faith. Speak in your faith. Pray in faith. Resist in faith. Don't change that. Amen? And you'll be in a place when you will enjoy the blessings of God. Because his word does say, surely goodness and mercy will follow you after you get to heaven. Surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of my life. That means here on earth. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But here on earth, surely goodness and mercy will follow you. You can walk in that goodness and mercy. You can walk in those tender mercies of the Lord. Surely goodness and mercy. You'll walk in it. 
that faith positions you and me to receive that, walk in it. So let's do that. Let's exercise our faith in God. Amen? Let's rise to our feet, please. I call our worship team up. I know I spoke slowly, took time on it, because I just feel that that really needs to be awakened in our hearts. That faith in God. We need that. I want to encourage you this morning. Whatever area of your life that you say, God, I need to receive from you. Those redemption blessings. I need to receive. Whether it's healing in your body. Whether it's a financial situation, family, marriage, children, whatever. His word. God has spoken. We don't have to say, Lord, speak the word. He has already spoken the words. It's spoken. Take it. Take a hold of that word. Stand firm on it. It doesn't matter how bad, how difficult the situation is. Nothing is too hard for God. Nothing is too hard. So don't give up. Can God change my situation? Nothing is too hard for God. Don't let anything or anyone determine your faith. Except God and His Word. What you believe and what you are convinced of is only going to be described and defined and determined by God and His Word. Because the devil has his trick. He says, look at so and so. They believed God and it didn't work for them. Look at so and so. They believed God, it didn't work for them. What do you tell the devil? My faith doesn't come by looking at so and so. My faith comes by hearing the word of God. It's good to see good testimonies. But then the devil is very quick to remind you of all the failures and disasters. But faith comes by hearing the word of God. Your faith should only be determined by God and his word. Thank God for good testimonies, but don't base your faith on testimonies. Testimonies can encourage your faith, but your faith must always be based on God and His Word. Because if you base your faith on testimonies, the devil will remind you of testimonies that didn't work out. What will you do then? Base your faith on God, His Word. So take your eyes off people. Put your eyes on God. On his word. What is your situation this morning? I want you to take a few moments to pray. And say, God, this is my situation. I want to receive your benefits over my life. There is no situation that's too hard for God. There is no life that, that's, that he can't touch and change. If he could change Saul of Tarsus. He can change anybody else. There is no circumstance that he can't turn around. There is no sickness or disease that he can't heal. It's only earthly doctors who say, I can't. We can't. Not God. God heals all our diseases. So, Father, in Jesus' name, even as we stand here this morning in your presence, Father, you know every life and you know every situation, you know every circumstance, and even those watching us live, God, you know what's happening in their homes, wherever they are seated. And we thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you pull us out, you pull people out of the horrible pit. Those who might find themselves in such situations, you redeem our life from destruction. Everything that has sought to destroy our lives, you redeem us out of. You bring it out. 
So Lord, let that redemptive work take place in the lives of people who may find themselves in those situations. That no weapon formed against them, no work of the enemy will succeed in destroying or ruining their lives. No work of the enemy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Father, even now, I just speak your healing over people who may need healing in their bodies. Whether it's an ailment that is considered small or whether it's an ailment that is serious and life-threatening, maybe even terminal, God. And even if there are people watching us live or on a deathbed or on a sickbed where there's incurable disease or a terminal condition Lord right now both here in this auditorium and those watching us live Lord I send your healing power in the name of Jesus against every sickness every disease every infirmity every pain every ailment every tormenting affliction in people's bodies and I command healing in Jesus name bones joints to be healed incurable conditions to be healed now chronic conditions be healed now because you heal us of all our diseases cause tumors and growths to disappear from our bodies nerves that have been damaged let them be healed Let there be restoration of motor function and nervous function. Let there be complete healing now in the name of Jesus. Injuries that have caused damage. Let there be a reversal of those things and wholeness coming in in the name of Jesus. Because you heal us of all our diseases. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Man. We bless you, God. Bless you. Let's say this together. Let's say Psalm 103, verse 1 to 6 together. All right? Just watch the screen. Just say the words. Let's say it together. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities. Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from destruction. He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. We thank you, Father. Thank you. We bless you. And we honor you. This morning before we close, I want to take a moment to give an invitation for anyone here this morning. You have never received Jesus Christ into your heart, into your life. Maybe you're visiting with us. Maybe you've been coming here for a few Sundays. But if you've never made a decision in your life to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your Savior, the one who forgives your sins, the Bible tells us that anyone who believes in Him, to them, He gives them the power to become the children of God. If you've never done that, if you don't know that you're a child of God, I want to lead you in a simple prayer before we close this morning so that you can take that step to receive Christ Jesus into your life 
and be a child of God. So let's just take a moment to pray. If you've never prayed this prayer before, you've never asked Jesus to come into your life and make you a child of God, I want to invite you to pray with me, please. Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. Forgive my sins. Make me a child of God. And help me to follow you the rest of my life. Thank you for doing this. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Anybody you prayed this prayer with me? For the first time? Here? I'd just like to see your hand. Anybody you prayed this prayer with me this morning? Could I please see your hand? Just raise your hand right where you are. If you prayed this prayer with me this morning. Okay. I don't see any hands. In case you prayed this prayer with me this morning, you made that decision to believe in Jesus Christ. On all our exits, there will be greeters waiting with a red bag. Um, on your way out, just tell them you prayed this prayer and you want to receive this bag. They will give it to you. They'll take your name and number down. We will be in touch with you. We'll help you grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're going to get ready to close. This coming week, we will be at in Chandigarh. We will be having a conference there with three to 400 pastors in Chandigarh. So just pray for that. Uh, we're, we'll be speaking to them on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So uh, just imparting that to pastors there. Uh, so just pray for the conference, the pastors conference happening two days uh, in Chandigarh, Tuesday and Wednesday. we we'll back Thursday. Okay, let's pray. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.